Well, the time now is 26 minutes to 10, so we're running about nine minutes late. And in 25 minutes' time, there'll be more contemporary music, music in our time. And tonight, you can hear four pieces by the Finnish composer Kaya Sariaho. But first, Reflections on Australia, a series of six interviews by Michael Charlton. Programme six, Dame Elizabeth Murdoch. Like Madagascar and the seas about, which yielded up the famous coelacanth, that Darwinian fish which had been thought extinct, Australia has proved itself the home of dynasties of successful lords of the press, Citizen Keynes and Lord Coppers, who elsewhere have lost the struggle for survival. Dame Elizabeth Murdoch is the wife of the late Sir Keith Murdoch, whose dispatches from Gallipoli in the First World War were instrumental in changing the course of the Dardanelles campaign and who went on to found a press empire in Melbourne. And she is the mother of Rupert Murdoch, who now bestrides the universe of communications and who accumulates newspapers and television stations as successfully and invincibly as the great Don Bradman once made runs. In the avowedly masculine Australian society, Elizabeth Murdoch is a matriarch. Few doubt that her virtues and values had a very considerable influence on the lives of two men who have in turn influenced the opinion and swayed the judgment of two generations. Dame Elizabeth is now 80 and has been a vigorous patron of charities and of Australian art and artists. Dame Elizabeth, I have in mind a particular painting by a particular Australian artist, Russell Drysdale, which he called The Drover's Wife. And it shows um, a heroic, mothering, proletarian figure in a harsh and, and, and very uninviting wilderness. And I wonder if you would reflect uh, on that strong and, and lonely figure and what it suggests, or s should suggest, about the contribution of women in Australia to the Australian achievement. Well, I think that I would be rather presumptuous, perhaps, to interpret what Tess Drysdale meant by that picture. But having learned a good deal about him, uh, I do think that he was tremendously taken by the outback and what it had meant, particularly to women, because so many of his pictures portray this loneliness and courage and isolation. And I'm sure that that had a great bearing on the development of this country. That courage of those women, of course, their men were adventurous and courageous, but it did really come back to the woman who kept the family going. And in a lot of Drysdale's work, uh, particularly his photography, there are magnificent photographs of the outback and of the Aboriginals, and they've been published, and it does, I think, show um, his understanding of what women meant to Australia. One wonders who that woman's counterpart is today, in this sense that um, in the 200 years since um, discovery and settlement by Europeans, uh, the Australians have barely moved inland. Uh, they're still no, that's right. clinging to the coast within 20 mm. miles of it in five cities. So. Who do you suppose the counterpart of that uh, woman is today? I mean, presumably she is a, a suburban heroine of some kind, would you agree? I think there are many heroines, <laughs> uh, but I, I wouldn't know that they were suburban ones. I think the suburban women, um, it, to my mind, um, unfortunately the situation's arisen, which I think is very regrettable in our society, that the economy is such that the majority of married women go out to work far too early. They go long before their children are independent of them. And the whole economy is scaled for that. You know, it's accepted now that a man, his average wage uh, doesn't have to cover the upkeep of children that the wife has to put in. And to my mind, that is one of the worst aspects of uh, life for the women, really, and for their families. Your own life occupies a rather large part of Australian history. Um, at 80 years old, after all, it's um, not much less than half of it. Um, 
And Australia's first century, would you agree, was a century largely without women. There were very few women in Australia, and it's only in the 1980s that women have come or become for the first time in Australia a majority, uh, or a very slight majority of that. Now, what effect do you believe that that had on men in Australia? It's said that women became seen in Australia as, as doormats, prized for childbearing and so on. I don't agree with that. I think that's something that's been rather um, uh, manufactured to suit a philosophy. We you, know. you recognize a political ideology in that. Yes, yeah, I do. I'm very much so. <laughs> and I think that um, over the, all over the world, I mean, it's not particularly Australia. There's something of, of, of that necessity of fertility in that Drysdale painting, I think, of that huge, mm, yes. powerful yes. Uh, woman. Uh, the need to populate the, the wilderness, mm. uh, to fill up um, Australia's empty spaces. Uh, I can remember an old headmaster of Scottish descent saying, constantly, constantly reiterating that Australian women were not doing their duty, as he put it. <laughs> uh, now, the limitation of family in, in, um, until quite recent times was seen as something decadent here, a selfish phenomenon. Um, do you think that that has added to the strain of women in Australia? Well, I myself would like to see them having larger families, but, um, you know, there's not much incentive. The government, I don't care which government, I'm not talking politically, but governments have not seemed to me supported those women who want to stay at home. There's no incentive or there's no help and encouragement. I think the young mothers uh, of good intentions and good character and, and uh, every potential to have good families, good Australians, they uh, find it extremely difficult because that is the section of the community which is not being helped. The lone parents are being helped, the unmarried mothers are being helped. This is felt quite keenly by people who are married and struggling and women who are trying to stay at home and bring up their children. It's just very difficult for them in the present economic climate. In his um, work of such great insight into the American uh, culture and the nature of it, uh, Tocqueville said, if I were asked, now that I'm drawing to the close of this work, in which I've spoken of so many important things done by the Americans, to what the singular prosperity and growing strength of their people ought mainly to be attributed, I should reply to the superiority of their women. Uh, might he have been able to say um, much the same thing about Australia had he been writing about this country? <laughs> Goodness knows, I'm not a, um, a student of history. I don't really think I could give a, uh, an authoritative view on that. Um, the country's only as good as its women, is, 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 is Well, is the my husband always used to say that. <laughs> the country is only as good as its women. But that doesn't mean to say that the men aren't good, too. Because after all, the men in this country did have to go out. They had to pioneer. They had to go through great, great hardships. And, and uh, I think it's been a joint thing. Tocqueville's reasons for that are, are important, of course. Um, There's a point you might like to reflect upon. He felt that there was a special reason for what he called the regularity of American uh, morals. And that reason seemed to him to be, he said, the principle of equality and the institutions derived from it. It swept away all imaginary uh, barriers. In aristocratic societies, men and women uh, brought together mm. uh, by their passions couldn't contract permanent uh, uh, ties. Um, a girl couldn't marry the man sh she loved because no, no, of the no, caste no. barriers. Yes, that's right. Um, but um, in, in, in the American democracy, a girl could marry the man of her choice, uh, no matter what. And, and therefore, breaches of the moral code before marriage were very, were very uncommon. Is that, is that something yes. you recognize as being part of, of the Australia you knew? Well, well, I think in the early days, there were, uh, there were many marriages uh, in between the different sections of the community. Yes, I suppose equality has uh, meant a great deal. When you were married to um, uh, Sir Keith, Murdoch, who had an, an, an immense influence on Australian taste and, and standards. You were married by his father, I think. Who, who well, a, who, yes, indeed, yes. Who was a Presbyterian minister. Mm. And a preacher, it said, of immense moral principle. Now, it's difficult to know uh, at this distance what, what that might have uh, meant. How should one understand that? Well, I think he had very high ideals of what family life was and duty to one's I suppose, uh, to one's God and one's country. He was very 
broad-minded, wise, tolerant, um, and of course, like most Scots, you know, he was a good scholar. The Scottish great ideal, of course, is education. His father before him was a, was a minister. Biographers um, of the Murdoch family say that his sermons are still remembered here in Melbourne. Um, Yes, well, I Can think you say for what? For their style or their content? No, I don't think that he was at all oratorical. Or I mean, I don't think he was um, a, a dazzling speaker. But I think the content was so good, and, and I'm sure suited his Presbyterian congregation. But Incidentally, I think Nellie Melba was at your at your wedding. Yes, she was. Yes, <laughs> raised her voice very handsomely <laughs> too. <laughs> Can't remember the hymns. I'm ashamed to say, but she was really very helpful in leading the, <laughs> the volume of voice. But uh, yeah, I was only 19, you know, and looking back on it, I, I was amazed that I had the cheek to think that I could ever be adequate, you know. But there you are, you're young and you're confident and well, you're you, you, weren't any, you weren't any young, you were a child bride, really, weren't you? Well, I suppose that was a bit known as a child bride. <laughs> <laughs> but this period marks some very important mm. uh, points of departure from Australia's parental origins, mm. uh, would you agree, that uh, Gallipoli, as you settled down to married life in the mm. 20s, had, had made Australia a a nation. Um, and Keith Murdoch was foremost among those who had seen to it that that would be so. Um, he yes, but he was very nationalistic, I would say, and ambitious for Australia on the highest possible level, having been through that those frightful times. I'm sure that what we say engendered in him a you know, determination that he was going to serve his country as best he could with his pen and had a very high idea of what journalists should be and do, and I think he was a person who was very, um, he was very sensitive. But what lay at the core of that uh, surge of Australian national feeling that he promoted? I mean, was it you that Australia, Australia was going to be a different kind of country, a special kind of, of place? I mean, what, do, what determined you and him um, in what was virtually a new world for Australia in the 1920s? What was going to mark it apart? Well, I suppose he felt perhaps it was had to come of age and stand on its own feet, perhaps rather more than it had, but still with this link, there is, as you know, quite a feeling uh, in this country that a republic will come. Mm. And I think when you see in recent years how the Anglo-Saxon uh, strain will be weakened and all these migrants come, how can you expect them to have any feeling for generation or two for the monarchy. They really d it doesn't mean anything to them. And I think that uh, sad to say for us people who have, have, have know the values, I mean, we may know the faults, we may know the difficulties and the weaknesses, but on the whole, many Australians still feel a loyalty to the monarchy. And with all its ups and downs, we'd like to think that that is something which will go on, but it won't. But I, I, I would interest me to know whether, whether you and Keith Murdoch uh, felt in the 20s that you were setting Australia or wished to see it set on some sort of idealistic path as an ideal republic in the Southern Ocean. No, I never thought about a republic uh, in, in those days. In fact, um, I find it hard to think about it now, but I think one has to be realistic that eventually it possibly will come. Uh, whether it's desirable or not, I don't know, but I think it's probably an inevitable sort of evolution of our... Development. But it, it is this time when the seeds of Australian nationalism uh, are being planted, which animated Keith Murdoch, mm. and later one must suppose your son Rupert. I mean, British stock or, or, or no, mm. it's a time when an important kind of distance is being put between Australia and mm. England mm. in terms of their traditional relationship. Yes. Um, and geographically, we have to remember our position, don't we? We are in the Pacific, and we are surrounded by uh, very populous nations all around us, and doesn't mean that I uh, expect to be enveloped, but I think that as time goes on with migration which will occur, that we will become, I think, more a Pacific nation. There are glimpses of that dissatisfaction with, um, with England and uh, with Australia's traditional relationship with England in Keith Murdoch's letters after the First mm. World War, uh, speaking of the Australian general, Brudenell White, yes, uh, yes. for example. Uh, First World War general, I, it seems to me he reveals his own mind, uh, your late husband, when he, when he said, Weiss is not nearly so strong in political as in military thought. Mm. He doesn't seem to me to see that the only banner under which the truly creative forces in Australia can be collected 
is the banner of Australianism. Um, he has still in him a lot of the old subservience to England, which we both agree can't operate in Australia, as the counterforce to two things. And he says the counterforce to Bolshevism and Sinn Féinism and all the present disuniting anti-Australian sections. Um, let's take the last of this. I mean, how should we have understood his feelings about the Irish dimension, about Sinn Féinism as a, as a disuniting force? No, I think Keith felt very strongly about that. Rightly or wrongly, I mean, I suppose we all may err, uh, perhaps, on the uh, emotional reaction to certain things about our history, but I think there was this feeling that uh, some of the dissension, some of the troubles in this country came from Irish migration. That doesn't brand the whole of the Irish people. My own grandfather was a uh, rather distinguished Irishman who came, well-educated and clever man. I mean, uh, when you talk about the Irish, you talk about perhaps uh, s certain uh, malcontents who came out here, and there's no doubt about it, they did have a bad influence in this country. I think Keith himself felt that uh, there needed to be a, a better realisation in England. I think he felt that England was not always very well informed uh, or appreciative of Australia. But on the other hand, he had a great admiration for Britain and the greatest admiration for Britain in the Second World War. He meant, made many, many, many inconvenient, dangerous trips across to write and bring to Australia what Britain was doing. Uh, I think he had a a great admiration, but that didn't perhaps cloud his objective view of where Australia probably would eventually go, and that didn't in any way, to my mind, it never suggested to me there was any disloyalty to Britain. Do you think that uh, Keith Murdoch's actions and beliefs at the time of Gallipoli, uh, notwithstanding what you said, represented some kind of sustained loss of faith um, in the Englishman. I mean, the famous Gallipoli letter, which, which yes. precipitated the evacuation of Gallipoli and, mm -hmm. and caused the recall mm -hmm. of the British commander-in-chief, Sir Ian Hamilton, and through which Keith mm -hmm. Murdoch makes mm -hmm. a, a leap into the higher reaches of, of British mm -hmm. politics. Now, in that letter, he said, um, the conceit and complacency of the red mm -hmm. feather men, as he wrote, of the mm -hmm. British officers, <gasps> uh, equaled only by their incapacity. Countless high mm. officers and conceited young cubs who are mm. only playing at war. What can you expect mm. of men who have never worked seriously, who have lived for their appearance or social distinction? Rather, rather bitter letter that. I mean, mm. in, in later yes. years, did he did he mellow yes. about that? And, uh, well, I think so. I asked him sometimes to talk about it because it was a very painful. It had been a very traumatic time for him, and, and he carried that hurt for a long time. I think. And I say, well, you know. Tell me about it, uh, looking back on it. Should you have done it or would you have done it again? He said, look, I knew that I was putting myself on the line, but I was so determined and so, I suppose, starry I and in those words, but he felt it's something he had to do. But he said, looking back on it now, I know I perhaps could have done it in a different way. And then I think then, as he grew older, I think he did take a more balanced view. There's no doubt about it. But he had great courage, my husband. He really had tremendous courage. And I get perhaps a better picture of maybe why he felt like it. Because as a young man, he went to England with this terrible stammer. He managed to save enough money from the sort of penny a line work he did for the age to take himself to England, try and get stammer cured. And he had, you know, very bitter, terrible experiences, though they had good introductions. When he got there, uh, the words couldn't come, and time and again, there was just within sight of getting a job. Uh, you know, he just had to agree that he couldn't be employed. And he went through a lot of very poor, hungry, Times, I think, as a young man in, in London, in that first trip. Are you saying this rather embittered his nature? And, and no, no, it didn't embitter his nature, but I think that it was a painful time, and it was then that he saw perhaps the senior side of England and the inequality. But it didn't make him bitter, and it didn't uh, stop him from going ahead and coming back and earning more money, and then going back a second time. He had terrific guts, Keith. 
During the Gallipoli incident, of course, he becomes the intimate of men like uh, Lord Northcliffe, uh, the founder of modern yes. popular journalism. And um, Keith Murdoch is later dubbed uh, your... The Northcliffe, your, yes. Uh, Lord, Lord Southcliffe. Well, I've forgotten <laughs> that, yes. I forget all these <laughs> little quips that pass um, away. So what he does, he does, of course, is transplant um, modern popular journalism to, to Australia in mm. a very effective way. Um, now, on the other hand, mass circulation daily newspapers on the Northcliffe model, at first sight, at first hand, don't seem to go with the more aggressive uh, individualism of the Australians. Mm. Uh, do you agree with that? Why do you think he succeeded in the way he did here? Well, he thought that the news should be brought to the people in an acceptable form and a form which would be intelligible to the masses, but it also goes some way to educating them in um, interesting things. I mean, a lot was done for the arts through Keith's papers. Of course, sport was very popular. and I suppose this was all sort of format, wasn't it, of the yes. Northcliffe papers? That's the, that's the, the point, mm. I, I think, that, uh, that one uh, might wish to make, that, that in looking for what's essentially Australian, it's easy to miss this point, but so, so much of it is notably derivative from... from uh, Britain, but maybe yes. everything, I mean, many of the things that he, that he said might have been said by a Beaverbrook or, or North yes, Cliff, would yes. you agree? Well, I think that you read many derogatory accounts of both North Cliff and of Beaverbrook, but on the other hand, you read a lot of good impressions of both of them. Like many, I suppose you'd say, great men, they were very um, many-sided, and Keith used to say that many of the greatest men he'd known had the greatest faults. And I think that's probably true.